state. The freedom bubbles. He, too, and our balloons were split between different ships for the journey across the ocean. Henry and I, though, found ourselves together on a vessel of four or five hundred tons called La Reine d'Azur. The French sailors asked us before we left harbour if we would care to take some concoction of theirs which was designed to prevent seasickness. The sky, they said, promised dirty weather ahead. Henry accepted the offer, but I refused. The liquid looked doubtful and smelled worse, and, as I told them, I had crossed the seas before. But that was a different sea. The narrow channel between my homeland and France and in different conditions. We put out into choppy, white-capped waves with a wind from the east whipping spray along their tops. This was the wind we wanted, and all the possible sail was crammed on to take advantage of it. La Reine swept along under a sky that steadily darkened, although it was not much past the middle of the day. A queen, perhaps, but a tipsy one lurching from side to side, digging her bows into the troughs as the waves increased and deepened, and scattering foam as she came up again. My own sensation was one of, at first, mild discomfort, and I thought it would pass as I grew used to the motion. I stood by the bulwarks with Henry, wrapped up against the wind and wet, and talked cheerfully and cracked jokes. The discomfort, though, instead of passing, grew more insistent. One of the sailors who had offered me the seasickness remedy passed and asked me how I was. I laughed and told him I was feeling fine, that it reminded me of the carousel that had been set up at the village fairs when I was a boy. The ship dropped at that moment from the crest of her upward swing down into horrific depth, and I shut my mouth and swallowed hastily. Fortunately, he had already gone. From that point, the ship's battle with the waves was matched by another waged by my mind against my stomach. I was determined not to show what I was feeling even to Henry. My pride was stupidly engaged and was relieved when he went below at the word that there was a hot drink waiting in the galley. He asked me if I were coming and I shook my head smiling desperately. I said, as was perfectly true, that I did not feel like a drink at the moment. So he left me and I hung on to the rail and stared at the sea, willing either it or my churning stomach to lie quiet. Neither did so. Time slowly passed with nothing happening except that the sky was darker, the waves more extreme, the shuddering plunges and climbs of La Reine de Jour more precipitous. My head was aching as well, but I hung on and felt I must be winning. Someone touched me from behind. Henry said, You still here, Will? You're a glutton for fresh sea air. I mumbled something. I don't know what. Henry continued. I was talking to the captain. He says he thinks there might be some really rough weather ahead of us. I turned, drawn by my incredulity over this remark. I opened my mouth to say something and, on second thought, closed it again. Henry said solicitously, Are you all right, Will? Your face is a funny colour, a bit like one of the masters, only greener. I plunged back to the rail, hung over it, and was sick. Not just once, but again and again. My stomach going heaving long after there could be possibly anything left in it to bring up. My recollection of the rest of the day, that night, and the following day is hazy, nor would I wish to remember more clearly. At some stage, the French sailor came back with his mixture, and Henry held my head while he poured it down my throat. I think I felt a little better afterward, but I could scarcely have felt worse. Gradually, my state improved. On the fourth morning, although I was still queasy, signs of hunger made themselves known. I washed in salt water, tidied myself up, and made my rolling way toward the galley. The cook, a fat smiling man who prided himself on speaking some English, said, Ah, 
So you are better yet? You have recovered le bon appétit? I'm prepared to break the fast. I smiled. I think I could manage something. Good, good. So we have the special breakfast for you. I've cooked him ready. He passed me a plate and I took it. It contained slices of bacon. They were thick. The meat was fat apart from a couple of narrow bars of pink. And they looked as though they had not been fried, but boiled in grease. Which still adhered to them. I stared at it while the cook watched me. And then the ship heaved one way and my stomach heaved another and I hurriedly put the plate down and staggered for the fresh air of the deck. As I went, I heard the cook's merry laughter echoing along the companionway behind me. By the next day, though, I felt perfectly well again. After my enforced privations, my appetite was enormous, and the food, in fact, was very good. The greasy fat bacon, I learned, was an old ship's cooked trick, and this one was particularly fond of practical jokes. Moreover, the weather improved. The seas were still high, but for the most part blue, mirroring skies empty apart from a handful of pelting clouds. The wind stayed fresh but moved around to the southwest and was less sharp. It was not the best quarter from the point of view of making progress, and a good deal of tacking had to be done to get what advantage we could. Henry and I offered our service, but we were turned down firmly. Our inexperienced hands and fumbling fingers would be more of a hindrance than a help. So we were thrown back on contemplation of the sea and the sky and on each other's company. I had noticed a change in Henry on his return from the Americas, and this had been confirmed during our long ballooning summer. It was not just a physical change, though he was much taller and leaner. There had been a change in his character too. I thought he was more reserved, and I felt that might be because he had more in reserve that he was sure of himself and of his aims in life. Aims, that is, apart from the one we all shared, of overcoming and destroying the masters. But we lived a communal life up in the hills with little opportunity for or inclination toward confidences. It was only now, in the long days of winter sunshine, with the sea stretching emptily to the four horizons, that he gave me some insight into what the aims might be. On the rare occasions when I turned my mind to look beyond our primary objective, and thought of the world that could be when it was liberated from our oppressors, my vision was hazy, and mostly, I am afraid, centred on pleasures. I envisioned a life of hunting, riding, fishing, all the things which I enjoyed made a hundred times more enjoyable by the knowledge that no tripod would ever again stride across the skyline. That we were the masters of our own habitation and destiny, and that any cities that were built would be cities for men to dwell in. Henry's meditations had been different. He had been much affected by his journey across the ocean. He and his companions had landed far to the north of the city on the Isthmus, in a land where, as I have said, the people spoke English, though with an unfamiliar accent. He was struck by the fact that there, thousands of miles across trackless seas, he could talk and be understood. Whereas when he and I crossed a mere twenty miles of water to France, we had found ourselves unable to communicate with those who lived there. From this, he went on to think more deeply about those divisions of men which had existed before the masters came, and which the masters, themselves a single race, one language and nation, had never understood, even though they did not fail to take advantage of them. It seemed to him monstrous that such a state should exist, that men should go out to kill other men they did not know, simply because they lived in a foreign land. This, at any rate, was something that had ceased with the coming of the masters. They brought peace, I agreed. But what a peace, the peace of herded cattle. Yes, Henry said, 
that's true but does liberty have to mean slaughtering each other men do not fight against each other anymore we all fight the common enemy frenchmen like beanpole germans like fritz americans like your friend walt now they fight together but afterward when they've destroyed the masters what will happen we shall remain united of course we've learned our lesson are you sure i'm certain it would be unthinkable for men to go to war with each other again he was silent for a few moments we were leaning against the starboard rail and far off in the distance i thought i saw something flash but realized it must be a trick of the light there could be nothing there henry said not unthinkable well i think about it it must not happen but we may have to work hard to make sure it does not i asked more questions and he answered them this it seemed was the aim he had set himself of working for the maintenance of peace among the people of the free world i was a little awed by it but not entirely convinced there had been war in the past, I knew, but that was because men had never had anything to unite them, as we now had in the struggle against the masters. Having once gained this unity, it was impossible to imagine that we would ever give it up, once this war was over. He was saying something, but I interrupted him, grabbing his arm. There is something out there. I saw it before, but was not sure. A small flash... Could it be something to do with the tripods? They can travel on the sea. I should be surprised to find them in mid-ocean, Henry said. He was watching where I pointed. The wink of light came again. He said, hmm. Low down, too, for a tripod. Not far above the surface of the water. Could be a flying fish, I should think. A flying fish? it doesn't really fly it leaps out of the water when the dolphins are pursuing it and it glides over the surface using its fin as a sail sometimes they land on board i believe they're quite good to eat you've seen them before henry shook his head no but the sailors have told me of them and of other things whales which are as big as a house and blow spouts of water up through the tops of their heads and giant squids and in warmer waters, creatures that look like women and suckle their young at the breast. The seas are full of wonders. I could imagine him listening to their tales. He'd become a good listener, attentive to what was being said, patient and thoughtful. That was another way in which he had changed from the brash boy I had known. I realised that if there were any need to keep men together after our victory, Henry was the sort of person who could help to do it. As things stood, Beanpole was becoming important among the scientists, Fritz was acknowledged as one of our best junior commanders, and even I, if only by luck, had had my moments of glory. Henry had been less successful, his one important enterprise a failure, though through no fault of his own. But it could be that in the world of the future, he would be more valuable than any of us, more even than Beanpole because what good would it do to rebuild the great cities of the ancients only to knock them down again? Though it was impossible that folly of that sort should happen again, and in any case the masters were not beaten yet, not by a long way. The large stage of our voyage took us through warmer seas. We were heading farther south than on Henry's first voyage, our landfall being close to the secondary base that had been set up in the mountains, some hundred miles east of the city. It is an odd thing that, although the two continents of the Americas lie north and south of each other, the narrow isthmus that joins them runs east-west. The primary base from which the flying machines had been launched had been abandoned after the failure of the attack. Weird steady winds behind us from the northeast, and I was told that these blew almost without changing throughout the year. Once we had come under their influence, they propelled us powerfully. 
The sea was full of islands of all shapes and sizes, some tiny and some enormous, that if the sailors had not kept me better informed, I would have taken them for the continent itself. We sailed quite close to many, and there were tantalizing glimpses of lush green hills, golden sands, feathery fronds of trees waving in a breeze. Only the very big ones, it seemed, were inhabited. It would be wonderful to land and explore them, perhaps when this was all over. Henry could do this preaching for peace on his own, I decided. I would not have been much use to him anyway. We landed at last and went ashore to feel the unfamiliar solidity of firm ground under our feet and to realise that we were back in the shadow of the enemy. This took place at dusk and we unloaded and carted our gear that night and the following day lay up in the cover of a forest. The work was difficult and not helped by the fact that we had to endure several torrential downpours. It was rain unlike any I had encountered before, almost as though solid water was sheeting down out of the sky. It drenched to the skin within seconds. In the morning, though, the sun beat hotly through the leaves of unfamiliar trees. I ventured out to bask and dry my clothes in a clearing nearby. We'd already climbed some way and this shelf of land looked a long way east. I could see the coastline with minute offshore islands. Something else, also. It was miles away but clear, pinpointed in the bright tropic light. A tripod. It took us several days to get to our base, and another week to complete our preparations. After that, all we had to do was wait. I'd had to wait before and thought I had learned the patience. There had been the long months of training for the games, the seemingly endless weeks of enforced idleness in the caves, the days by the river preparing for our invasion of the city. All these, I thought, had schooled me, but they had not. For this was waiting of an entirely different kind, waiting with no fixed term and on a permanent alert. We were dependent not on any decision of men or even of the masters, but on the vagaries of greater force than either, nature. Our planning staff had consulted with those recruited in our earlier expeditions who had lived here all their lives and knew the country and its weather. We had to have a wind which would carry our balloons over the city, a wind that is, from the northeast. This was, in fact, the prevailing wind which had brought us on the last leg of our voyage, and at this time of year, constant. Unfortunately, it normally died out over this very strip of land into the equatorial calm which prevailed to the south and west. We must wait for a moment of greater wind strength if we were not to find ourselves becalmed and even drifting away from our target. So we had advanced positions set up, as near as possible to the city, whose duty was to report back by pigeon when the wind was holding strongly enough in that direction. Until they did, we could do nothing but chafe at the delay. And chafe we did. Ours had been the second to last party to arrive, but although many had waited longer, I found myself one of the least able to accept the situation. I flared up at the smallest provocation when one of the others made a joking remark that I was so full of hot air he doubted if I needed a balloon. I sailed into him and we fought furiously until we were dragged apart. That evening, Fritz spoke to me. We were in a tent which was leaking in several places. The rain of this land was not easily stopped by canvas. It washed down relentlessly. As he remonstrated with me, I said I was sorry, but he was not impressed. You have been sorry before, he told me, but you keep on doing things without thinking. Flying off the handle. We cannot afford dissension here. We must live together and work together. I know, 
I said. I will do better. He stared at me. He was fond of me, I knew, as I of him. We had been together a long time and shared hardships and dangers. Nevertheless, his expression was grim. He said, As you know, I am in charge of the attack. Julius and I discussed many things before we left. He told me that if I was not sure of any men, I must leave him out of the assault. He spoke of Uville in particular. He liked me, but duty came first, as it always would with Fritz. I pleaded with him for a last chance. In the end, shaking his head, he said he would, but it really was a last chance. If any trouble occurred in which I was concerned, he would not bother to find out who was responsible. Out I would go. The following morning, in the course of our usual drill on the balloons, the one I had fought with tripped me. Perhaps accidentally, perhaps not. And I went sprawling. Not only did my elbow hit a chunk of rock, but I landed in a patch of sticky mud. I closed my eyes and lay there for at least five seconds before getting up again. With a smile on my face and my teeth tightly gritted. Two mornings later, through yet another downpour, a bedraggled pigeon alighted on the perch in front of its box. A little scroll of paper was fastened to its leg. We had twelve balloons altogether in our force, with one man to each so as to be able to carry the greatest possible weight of explosive. This was sealed inside metal containers, something like the grooved metal eggs we had found in the ruins of the great city but very much larger. It was not too easy a task to lift them over the edge of the basket. They were fitted with fuses which would cause them to explode four seconds after the release was pulled. This meant, Beanpole had explained to us, that we needed to make our drop from a height of just under 150 feet. The calculation depended on something which had been discovered by a famous scientist of the ancients called Newton. He tried to explain it, but it was beyond our comprehension. Beyond mine, anyway. What it meant was that an object falling through the air travelled a distance in feet of sixteen, multiplied twice over by the number of seconds it had been falling. Thus, in the first second it would fall sixteen feet. Sixteen multiplied by one, multiplied by one. In two seconds, sixty-four feet and in three, a hundred and forty-four, and the fourth second was the time allowed for getting the bomb, as he called it, into position and ready for the drop. We had practiced with dummy bombs over and over again, learning to calculate distances from the ground, to estimate time and so on. There was also the question of the forward motion of the balloon, which naturally affected the place at which the bomb dropped. We had become reasonably skilled in the art. Now we had to apply it. The balloons went up at two second intervals into a sodden grey sky and a wind dragging in from the ocean behind us. Our order had been allocated by Fritz who went first. I was sixth and Henry tenth. As I cast off and found myself shooting skyward, I looked downward at the faces so quickly dwindling below. I saw Beanpole looking up his spectacles, almost certainly obscured by rain. It was hard luck on Beanpole, I thought, but the thought was fleeting. I was more concerned with having made it myself, with being freed of the delays and irritations. The lashing rain had already soaked me, but that was unimportant. We soared higher in a long line that still preserves some irregularity. The country on which I looked down was a strange one, made up of low pointed hills, rounded but in all sorts of different shapes and covered by the dense forest that stretched away almost to reach the grey line that marked the ocean. The rain drove steadily on the driving wind, valleys unfolded again behind me, gradually the hills flattened and the forests gave way to fields of crops. There were occasional small villages of whitewashed houses, a river appeared and for a time our course followed it. The line was breaking up, spreading out, affected by small inconstancies in the wind. Some balloons were making better progress than others. 
I was chagrined to find my own was falling behind. We were in two main groups, nine in advance and three of us forming a rear guard. Henry was one of the three. I waved to him and he waved back. We lost the river but found this or another not long after it. If it was the same one, it had widened. Later it flowed into a lake, a long neck of water stretching for at least ten miles on our right. The land beneath us was barren and lifeless with a scorched blackened look. This would be part of the zone around the city, which the masters had laid waste as a defensive measure. I looked ahead more keenly but saw nothing but water on one side and burnt empty land rising on the other. The advanced balloons were increasing their lead over the rest. It was infuriating, but there was nothing to be done about it. In fact, we were all travelling more slowly because the rain had died out and the wind had dropped. Our course had been carefully calculated, but I wondered if the calculation might not be off or the wind had changed direction so that we would drift aimlessly out to sea. Ahead, the lake dog-legged to the right, but at that point, it ran south of west, almost straight, absolutely regular, a ditch that the ancients had made to take their ships across the isthmus from one ocean to the other. There were no ships in it, but there was something else straddling it, a gigantic, green-shelled, golden beetle. The calculation had not been wrong, Right ahead of us lay the third city of the Masters. I did not have much time for contemplation. My attention was taken up by something else which appeared from behind high ground to the left of the city. Presumably the tripod was returning in the ordinary way to its base, but, catching sight of the cluster of bubbles bobbing through the air, it checked and changed course. It got to them when the first balloon was within a hundred yards of the wall. A flailing tentacle came close, but missed, as the balloonist, jettisoning ballast, sent his craft soaring. The others were approaching the tripod too. The tentacle flailed again, and this time struck home. The balloon crumpled and dropped to the dark, wet ground below. The tripod was like a man swatting insects. Two more balloons in the advanced group went down. The others got past. The first was over the city, something fell from it. I counted one, two, three. Nothing happened. The bomb had failed to explode. Two other balloons were off target to the left, but the remaining three would cross over the expanse of green crystal. Another bomb dropped. Once more I counted. There was a great thump of sound as it went off. But the dome, as far as I could see, was still inviolate. I could not watch what was happening ahead after that. The tripod stood directly in my path. Everyone so far had dropped ballast to rise and dodge the enemy's blows. I guessed he would be getting used to the manoeuvre, waiting until the tentacle was moving to its strike. I pulled the release cord and, with a sickening lurch, felt the balloon drop. The tentacle passed overhead. I had no idea by how much, for my attention was on the ground towards which I was falling. Hastily, I threw out sandbags and the balloon shot up. The tripod was behind me. The city ahead, glancing back, I saw one of the two last balloons struck down, the other coming on. I hoped it was Henry, but could not look to find out. I'd heard two more explosions, but the city's dome still stood intact. My balloon was over it, and looking down I could dimly see, through its translucent green, the clustered peaks of the pyramids inside. My height was about right, though more by luck than anything else after the evading action I had been forced to take. Reaching down, I pulled out the fuse pin and heaved the bomb up over the basket's edge, poised it for an instant, and let go. The balloon lifted with the release of weight. I counted the seconds. Just before three, the bomb hit, skidded, bounced from the curve of the dome. It went off, and the blast of air rocked me violently. With dismay, I saw that there was no sign of a break in the crystal. That left just one balloon, one single hope. 
It was Henry. I knew by the colour of the shirt he was wearing. He was going in dead centre over the city, but not keeping the height that Beanpole and the scientists had prescribed. I watched him dropping, dropping. The basket scraped the surface of the dome. Then I understood what he was about. He had seen the failure of those of us in front and understood the reason for it. The scientists had told us that the bombs were powerful enough to shatter the crystal, having experimented on the broken dome of the city we had taken. But of course, the bomb had to be touching or very close to the crystal when the explosion took place. Our bombs had ricocheted sufficiently to be outside those limits. The odds were against his being any more successful, at least as far as dropping a bomb was concerned. But planting was another matter. My own transit had been toward the edge with the roof a falling curve beneath me. Henry's course had taken him across the centre. The dome flattened there, and a man could walk on it. My mind was a confusion of hope and horror. The basket scraped against, bounced up, dropped... I saw the distant figure struggle to lift something. As I watched, he scrambled over the edge of the basket. The balloon, released, rose sharply into the sullen grey sky. Henry stayed there, crouching, ant-like, against the gleaming surface that stretched all around. Crouching and cradling something in his arms, I turned away. Not until some seconds after the explosion did I have the heart to look back. The master's air billowed up like green smoke from a ragged hole, which, as I looked, crumbled still further at the edges. Almost blindly, I pulled the cord and let my balloon drop toward the waiting earth.